just to say that we are in the UBC here at this privacy level labs. Theater, we are at the unceded territories of the Musqueam and Rinsulut nations, and we would like to welcome the Fish Globe Consortium, who are here now. Um, Fish Globe Consortium, we've been working on this consortium since three years, and um, this is led by Professor uh, Bastien Merigo of the University of Montpellier, and I don't know where you're from, you're from Rutgers University. <laughs> Oh, uh, 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 yeah, and uh, Jim Thorson from the NIA. I forgot. <laughs> um, uh, Nancy Shackle from the FO in the East. Uh, Zoe Kitchell, who is from Rogers University. Melin Pinsky, also from Rogers University. And Rob. Very difficult to say name last name. Guralnik. Guralnik. Guralnik from the University of Florida. Right. Okay. So this is the consortium, and you will hear from us about what Fish Globe is, what we've been working on the last three years. We can have uh, more than ten years of uh, of service. We can provide a count of fish and also their biomass. Uh, usually it's performed uh, on the continental shelf, so it means not below 200 underliters in productive area where fisheries are used. But one important aspect is that they are heterogeneous in terms of something strategy, in terms of uh, temporal and spatial extent across the world. And so if we want uh, to study them in an accurate way, we have to consider also all this uh, kind of variation. And an important aspect also is that um, the accessibility in terms of data use is very different according to the surveys. Some are publicly available, some other are private, so the degree of access can vary uh, across the group. So the idea of our group first was to uh, create an, an integrated database and also an infrastructure to collect the, the main survey that have been performed worldwide in order to support uh, the science involved in biodiversity conservation and also the decision of stakeholders involved in uh, <coughs> fishery management and also in, in biodiversity conservation. So uh, in this context, you, now we, we are going to, to present you different uh, aspects related to our research activity. So the first one uh, uh, is a, a work that I've uh, led uh, Aurore Moreau during uh, the end of her PhD and, uh, and postdocs in collecting uh, service data and, uh, and try also to have an integrated uh, integration of uh, integrated view of, of this data set. And then Zoe Kitchell, uh, who is in PhD uh, in the US, we present you a work she has done linked to this data set to try to understand how the species assemblages have varied across time depending on um, the different survey we have uh, studied. Then Marine Pisky, who is a researcher at the Oregon University, we go through another topic uh, that is uh, quite uh, linked to the previous one. The fact that some changes in, uh, in the species assemblages can have important application of transboundary stocks, so stocks that could be shared among uh, countries. And Nancy Shaktel, so she's from uh, the DFO, West. Eastern in Canada, and Jim Thorpon uh, will present you the, um, uh, the application we can have in terms of uh, fishery uh, management. And finally, uh, Dan Palmares and uh, Robert uh, Goranik will present you the, the platform and infrastructure we are building to uh, provide this data set and also to enhance collaboration between science and also the stakeholders involved in. Uh, in biodiversity and, uh, and fishery measurement. So now we, we will have the talk of uh, Ron Moreau, who is now a postdoctorate in uh, at Rogers University.
in 2019 because many early career and all the scientists who were working with voluntary surveys in different regions of the world, but we didn't have any coordinated way and we were all working in parallel, so that wasn't very efficient. And so we started to build a team and to think about this sampling across different areas of the world to try to understand where data are and like how available they are and like how can we enhance scientific collaborations to um, boost understanding and knowledge of biodiversity and the global change with the surveys. So here I'm showing a few photos of how this sampling is actually happening at sea. So they uh, are on fishing boats and they use a bottom troll gear to sample communities of fish and other invertebrates that are close to the seafloor. And here I'm showing photos of areas of the world where uh, we usually don't have surveys. So we have places from Israel and from Iceland as well as the Western Black Sea. So these are areas that usually we don't hear about very often and that uh, we were able to collaborate with people from these regions. And so uh, what we've done uh, at the conference, a few of us, is to start thinking about how can we have an overview of all these surveys and instead of requesting the actual data, we focus on metadata of the surveys of, uh, for instance, geolocation of sampling, date, as well as making these connections with people around the world. And so we published a paper in 2021 that had 75 offers based on all of the people that we were able to reach out to. And so this uh, metadata inventory led to find 95 bottom troll surveys that occur between 2001 and 2019 that had at least three years of sampling through these years. And uh, we found more than 283,000 samples of scientific surveys that happened in space and time. Um, we found that 59% of this metadata are not publicly available. So like, it's a huge portion of uh, information that is not uh, available globally. Sometimes for very good reasons, uh, because uh, availability is also very linked to geography around the globe. So we found that most public surveys are obviously placed in areas of rich countries, such as Europe and North America, that have a policy related to open science. And we found that uh, a lot of the surveys that are, for instance, in Africa or in Asia uh, are way more restricted. And um, but interestingly, we found that most of the important continental shelves of the world do have sampling ongoing. And so there's a real opportunity to build collaborations around the world to be able to uh, have like, a more coherent consortium and uh, monitoring collaborations. So what we've done with, um, with the Fish Lab Consortium and the Working Group that was funded by the French Biodiversity Foundation is to explore what this data can do in terms of understanding community change. And to be able to do that, we had to go through the exercise of creating a database. And so this map shows the database of all the public surveys that we had very easy access to, and we had like some already some kind of expertise in the group. So we have 26 bottom troll surveys that happen all along the continental shelves. And on the right side, I'm showing for each of the different surveys on uh, the y-axis, uh, the time series and the colors represent the number of samples. And so you can see that the surveys, they start at very different time and some of them start in the 60s. So it's like really long uh, spatial temporal monitoring. Um, and uh, also that the number of samples that we have in regions is also sometimes pretty large. And so it represents this huge information that uh, is right now public and everyone actually can use it. And we also were able to establish uh, collaborations with other uh, regions that allowed us to have access to these surveys but more on a private uh, access that allowed to do some research but uh, is not obviously public because it depends on what the data provider wants. Uh, so for instance, we were able to access surveys in South Africa, in Namibia, in New Zealand, in most of the northern Mediterranean Sea and uh, other places. And so now I'm going to leave it up to Zoe. One potential consequence of the fact that we extract critters from the ocean and also critters in the ocean are moving in response to changing environmental conditions <laughs> Microphones are new. Um, uh, one potential outcome of those changes uh, is biotic homogenization, in which 
Communities across space lose their unique identities and composition of species over time. On the flip side, we can also have biotic differentiation, where you actually see an increase in the uniqueness of communities of species over time. Uh, and so what we were interested in is we know that this is happening a lot in terrestrial systems. We also know that this has happened to a few examples of marine ecosystems in terms of uh, bottom fish specifically, but we wanted to see how widespread these two phenomena were. We were able to, Aurora mentioned that we have nearly 100 uh, surveys that we've identified and we were able to use 37 of those for these analyses. And what we found is that there were a handful that were differentiating, and there were also a handful that were homogenizing. But in general, we didn't see that many directional shifts in community composition, either towards homogenization or towards differentiation over time. What really stood out to us, though, as we worked on these analyses, is that, yes, there weren't that many areas that were trending for its homogenization or differentiation, but there was a lot of interannual variability in the amount of dissimilarity in these marine ecosystems. Within a single region, you have one year of high dissimilarity followed by a year of rather low dissimilarity. And in the plot here on the left-hand side, you have year on the x-axis, dissimilarity on the y-axis, and each trend line, which is built by the points that you see in this graph as well. Uh, each color represents a different survey region. So I don't expect you to take too much from this graph here other than there's a lot of nuance across all these different regions. And we're trying to better understand what some of the drivers of this nuance and variability might be within a region. Uh, and we found that within individual survey regions, both temperature and also fishing pressure can help us explain some of that variability across time. And the ability to look at the global scale, but then also zoom in on these patterns that are happening in specific regions is really only possible because of our ability to use this really awesome collaborative data set. As Zoe was, as ex was explaining, one of the amazing benefits of putting together these worldwide data sets is the comparisons uh, between different ecosystems, green ecosystems around the world that reveal the changes that are happening just off our coast, but that otherwise we're, we're not aware. We don't realize. The other real benefit of these data sets, though, are that they allow us to integrate across coastlines and across national boundaries and other political boundaries. So this map that I'm showing you right here uh, is for Atlantic Cod. In, in red, we're seeing outlines for uh, different stocks or populations of Atlantic Cod. These are is a very important fishery species, historically incredibly important in the North Atlantic. And as you can see, and then you're also seeing here uh, what are called exclusive economic zones, so the areas of the ocean that more or less are controlled by different, different countries, especially from a fisheries perspective. And you can see that many of these populations and cod, Atlantic cod in general crosses many national boundaries. It also crosses many different surveys. So every survey that's out there only captures one small view, one small insight into what's happening at an entire population level or even across entire species at a species scale. Part of what we've been doing within the, the Fish Globe Consortium is developing methods for integrating across these surveys um, within countries and across across different countries. This is one example here from the, the West Coast looking at arrow-toothed flounder. It's a, an important predator on the West Coast and Alaska it's also supports a commercial fishery. And what you're seeing here, all the way from California up to the northern Bering Sea in Alaska, uh, the colors are showing you in orange and red places with especially high density of arrowtooth flounder. And areas that are in blue, we're seeing those are low, very low densities of arrowtooth flounder. But this, this map was made possible by integrating across 10 different surveys. Uh, this is the West Coast Annual Survey, all the way up to NBS, the North Bering Sea Survey. But including surveys from uh, just off the coast here in British Columbia as well. And that kind of integration across boundaries hasn't been, been possible before. It's been very difficult to do. And this isn't just of 
sort of scientific importance, though it's, that is a very important uh, application. This also has important application implications for fisheries management and international relations. Just as, as one example uh, that's been in the news a fair bit, in the early 2000s, uh, Northeast Atlantic mackerel, important fishery species in the North Atlantic, uh, shifted their distribution up into Icelandic waters. Uh, and I, the, shift in, then the shift had been tied to uh, warming ocean waters. And Iceland naturally wanted to start fishing that population. European Union and a number of the other countries that also uh, fish Atlantic mackerel wanted to continue fishing mackerel. And they couldn't agree on how to divide up the, the total catch that is sustainable for this particular population. It meant that overall the fit, there were too many fish, at least an unsustainable number of fish that were taken out of this population. But it wasn't something that just stayed in fisheries management. It actually uh, spilled over, it, uh, it became a trade war between uh, Iceland and the European Union. Uh, it also involved the Faroe Islands at one point. And there's some indications that also contributed to Iceland's decision to drop their bid to join the European Union. So, you know, ended up disrupting international relations at an extremely high level. Which is astounding when you think about these are allies, these are democratic nations that operate on so many different things. And yet, these uh, climate-driven shifts in resources can really be at a key friction point in terms of cooperation across, across countries. I will say they are still not cooperating about 15 years later over management of this particular uh, fishery. So it's not just a hypothetical, hypothetical issue. And this is also not just a North Atlantic issue, but we've done uh, a fair bit of uh, modeling of shifting species distributions around the world, and areas in red highlighted in this, in this particular map are places that are expected to gain one new transboundary fishery stock, similar to Northeast Atlantic mackerel. And you can see that those shifting resources are spread all over the world, that potential for conflict over climate-driven shifts in resources. And data like fish globe that integrates across these national boundaries also helps create a shared understanding uh, shared basis of knowledge for state of the ocean that, and eventually cooperation that then can be very important uh, under basis for then building international cooperation at many other levels. <coughs> so, um, you can start with science but then build out to many other aspects of international relations and, and cooperation. And with that, I also want to turn it over to Nancy Chapel. There's always conflict, and now you can imagine that with with climate change, that's even exacerbated further. So one of the ideas is that we need a lot more science in this era of dynamic uh, change. We need a lot more science to, to look at what's happening, and what BFO and NOAA have done have joined have made a climate and fisheries collaboration framework, an initiative that started in January 20. In response to those climate concerns that are going across borders. So, given that growing demand, we've had demand also from you know citizens, fishermen, everybody is saying, what are we going to do? And as a regulatory agency, we actually have to do something and do that planning. But we need the science behind that. And we got together and we recognize the the, the, the commonality, the common interests, and also those cross boundary impacts. I don't know if you noticed on Malin's slide, but we're, we're gaining, we will, we're predicted to gain <laughs> species from the Northeast on both the Atlantic, so they're, they're, that will lead to problems, and we have to know what to do about it. But we need the science and the evidence to, to create that policy. So in 2018, we held a joint workshop that led to a framework for collaboration in 2021, and as, as bureaucratic as that sounds, that recognition of it really means something in terms of, uh, in terms of government. So the purpose, um, the purpose of DFO collaboration framework is to foster collaboration to better track, understand, and respond to the impacts of climate variability and change on stocks, marine ecosystems, and fisheries. So get the science where we can feature the advice so that we can get tools that go to management so we know what to do. Just as a reminder to everybody, people fish on location, and when that location is starting to change, it brings problems. Um, 
we have these we have these uh, collaboration uh, research hubs in the Arctic, Pacific, and Atlantic across all the borders. And now Jim is going to provide examples from the Pacific Coast. So um, what I'm hoping to do here is talk a little bit about the fish below infrastructure. And kind of shift gears a little bit from thinking about the applications and uses of fish globe to how to kind of coordinate activities and build a community of researchers, uh, data producers, and uh, infrastructure experts to help kind of make the community all work together. What I want to start with is just saying that infrastructure really revolves and depends on people, right? People have to build the infrastructure, people have to use the infrastructure, people have to feel invested in making the infrastructure work, right? And so when I talk about fish globe infrastructure, I'm thinking mostly about networks of people, data, and, and really diver diversity of all, of all sorts and kinds. And um, I think that, that ecosystem um, of sort of um, infrastructure components really has to work around mutual co-benefit, right? Everyone has to benefit from being involved in the infrastructure and find value and reason for spending their time and energy building that infrastructure for its use for action, right? And so um, one way of thinking about that is to think about infrastructure from the perspective of data producers who are forming these networks to share their data. Those are on the left-hand side of the slide. Um, there's the, the um, thanks. Meg is going to be my, my enabler for pointing out things on the slide grade. So on the left-hand side of the slide, we have our data producers are sharing uh, network, uh, sharing um, kind of coordination. Um, in the middle, we have the infrastructure itself, where there's mechanisms for ingesting data, for building out the data and metadata standardization, which actually turns out to be really challenging and difficult and interesting, um, <laughs> as Aurora might know. Um, we have tools for data quality checking to make sure that data pass certain filters for quality, um, and quality control, and quality insurance. And we have taxonomy management um, in many cases. Well, that's fine. Hit this button, that's right back. Um, and so that all goes into an integrated data store. The data store can contain things like, like abundance of biomass estimates, but it can also contain a whole set of other characteristics we're interested in, like traits, right? Those might be there as well. We have to provide access to this data store. Um, it's often done through APIs or through um, other kinds of services. Many of you might be familiar with using um, R in the R ecosystem, but there's certainly other ways as well, through Python or through good um, access points that allow that access. And, and critically, we have these user communities, right? Managers, scientists, educators, decision makers, who are going to access the infrastructure using access tools or be looped in, right? So there's this hugely valuable link between user communities, which have data producers, and the connectivity that that enables, right? And so that's all part of building a really critical ecosystem and infrastructure to have that community buy in and that community kind of purpose cycle. That connects users, producers, and the infrastructure developers. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Thanks. Thank you. So, we get a little bit more so into the details of how this works. Right now, we have existing linkages between uh, Fish Globe um, and Fish Base via the world. What's it? The what is worms? World Register of Marine Species. World Register <laughs> of Marine Species that ensures the taxonomic integrity of all the data that goes into fish globe. Then you have fish base, which provides, I think you all know, but I don't know if you all know, but fish base provides observed traits data. Traits, species traits data being oh, how fast the fish grows, what is the length rate relationship of, uh, of a fish? What is the maximum length that the fish grows to? And so on and so forth. Um, and this, not all species actually, the fish base does not provide traits for all species. So in some ways, we have to impute the traits. And that is provided for by Jim's uh, fish life, uh, uh, what do you call it? It's a fish life program. Right? Yeah, phylogenetic trait imputation. <laughs> so, um, and this then for in integrates all of the traits data that is needed for a fish to run uh, all the models. 
and all of the traits linked to the species are included into the data store. Now, of course, in future linkages, we would like to be able to uh, connect fish flow very well and more integrated with fish base because then things can go from fish globe to fish base and from fish base to fish globe. So um, all of the improved data sets, for example, thank you to Farad's Fish Life, can go into fish base. Um, we would also like to be able to provide occurrence data, for instance, to the OBIS and GPF uh, platforms via the Darwin Core, Humboldt or Darwin Core. I do not know what Darwin Core is, but they do. <laughs> <laughs> no, Rob does. <laughs> and uh, then we would very likely be uh, an, an important information source for marine um, and fisheries ecosystem um, management platforms. So you have FishMIP and Ecopathy XC, most likely. And there you go. And all of this data sharing information could be two ways. Best, best if it was two way, um, but um, maybe in the near future it could be one way. And then we, we improve it to two ways. And there you go. That's uh, sort of the technical part of the of the thing. <laughs> We give it back to Bastien. Merci. So we have highlighted the importance to provide an integrated data set and also infrastructure, which can support science and collaboration within the scientific, but also toward the stakeholders who are involved in um, biodiversity conservation and also fishery management. But this can be successful only if we can maintain our collaboration between Canada, USA, and France. And we are also very open to uh, new collaboration, of course. And uh, if you have any uh, interest in Fish Globe or suggestion, we are welcome to, to hear from you. And also, if you have uh, any question, we, we have time to, to discuss now if you want. And thank you for your attention. And thank you again uh, to our sponsor, to the French Embassy in Canada, to Sea Rounders to the French Foundation for Biodiversity Research, Oregon University, and the University of Montpellier. They allow us to have a <coughs> second in-person meeting. The first one was in Montpellier last year. That time, one year after we are here in Vancouver, and we hope to continue uh, have a, at least an early in-person meeting at this one. Thank you.